Welcome to the CG Pro Podcast. I'm Ed Dawson Taylor, and this is episode 43 with Christian Kestner, who is a visual effects supervisor from Framestore. Um, we'll introduce Christian in just a second, but taking a, a minute before we get going to thank our sponsor, Autodesk, who made some of the software I've used for most of my career, um, like Maya and 3ds Max. And um, big thanks to, to Autodesk for this episode. Um, so if you enjoy tonight, you can follow us in our Facebook group and at becomecgpro.com. Uh, so tonight's guest, I'm very excited to welcome Christian Kessner, visual effects supervisor from Framestore. He's worked on many amazing movies and, and other types of content in the past, um, but some really, really cool movies such as Avatar and Gravity and some movies that have really uh, helped shape the the techniques that we now call virtual production, um, as well as obviously lots of traditional visual effects. But uh, Christian, I will uh, leave it there and uh, say thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, Ed. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so uh, how did this all get started for you? How did you get into film? Were there some early things early in life that made you realize that you wanted to do film or how how did it how did it come about yeah it's one of those things where i think a lot of people want to go into film i actually wanted to go into commercials i have a um a background in graphic design i used to work as an art director i um got my um bachelor's degree in graphic design in hamburg in germany and used to work in advertising agency and you know actually mostly print and then ILM actually had a commercial division still at that time. And they were doing like really cool Super Bowl spots and, and those sort of things. And, you know, like sort of exploring the, um, the, 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 the 3D size of, you know, computer graphics. And that sort of, you know, my brother had, had studied abroad in, in, in Stetson and in, in Florida. And then went back to Georgetown and I, I stayed in Germany and I was like, I got itchy feet somehow. And so the easiest way to go live abroad somewhere is to get it, you know, to study. And all these things combined uh, really just made me, all right, maybe I go somewhere in the field of um, 3D animation, visual effects. And I got my master's of fine arts at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. And then I, I was determined to go into commercial production somewhere and do commercials and, you know, become a flame artist or something like this. Mm. And just through coincidence, through a friend that I met uh, in, in San Francisco, he was working at the orphanage at the time, which was a, a company that was founded by, you know, Kevin Bailey and Stu Mashwitz and, you know, like uh, some good guys from ILM that had sort of broken off in their, in their own little um, company and, I got my foot in the door there, like really just by coincidence. And um, that's how I ended up in the film industry. And I, I don't regret it at all. I, I really enjoy it. And I actually enjoy long projects more than, than I thought I would. So what, what made you want to get into commercials then? It's an interesting, I, I was the same actually in the beginning, although I tried film and then jumped into commercials, but you, you really wanted to go towards commercials. Why, why was that? Because it, like if you're, like graphic design illustration and it's all a little bit like especially you know advertising photography it's all a little bit stylized it's not really you know trying to do what cinema does and you know it's a different sort of um uh world lighting and, and st stylistic uh stylistically and i really and like, i really liked it i liked the the super bowl spots that they and that ilm did and you know like i thought it was an interesting um uh, world and I actually did a Nike like a fake Nike commercial as my thesis project as well um, and I like I always liked the, the people that I work with everything was always sort of like fast paced and you know like you don't spend too much time on, on it but um, it all changed when I joined the film industry <laughs> right yeah different very different um, you could be on a project for a number of years rather than the number of hours even in commercial exactly but... exactly yeah yeah. So you you uh, you went to study at Academy of Art in San Francisco. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you uh, how that kind of helped you jump into the industry? Well, I think 
Um, what I'm benefiting right now in my career is actually the combination of a of a background in like traditional illustration and graphic design. And you know, we had to like when I went to get my bachelor's in Hamburg, um, our director of the school was determined that computers are wrong. You know, <laughs> computer don't do it right if you can't if you don't have the eye for it. Which to a certain degree is, is is true. Like so, if you just you know use your whatever InDesign, whatever, and and type something that spacing usually is you know isn't correct, the kerning and stuff like that. So like we had to do a lot of traditional writing, but really training the eye. Like that was really like we I, I learned to write with ink and you know with with with, um, with brushes and took black and white photography. And I think that is really the foundation of building a good eye. And then in San Francisco, which is a great school because it has so many areas. It has screenwriting, has directing and stuff like that. But obviously my my focus was 3D animation visual effects and I focused on the, on the visual effects branch. But I had access to a producer. I had access to, you know, just in, like in the circle of friends, um, I I had people who were, you know, more sufficient and I like, go more more experienced in lighting and and and, and so forth. So uh, that was a really great experience because we ended up doing a collaborative project. Um, in, in the and they have a green screen studio, so I really I really enjoyed it there. And um, they have great mentors, actually Brian Connor, um, who won the Oscar for for, um, for the first Dune. He was one of my men one of my mentors. Um, and you know, you get to meet people like John Knoll, you know, like it's Hal mm -hmm. Hickle, like it's like it, just being in San Francisco just really gives you that little buzz, I know, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of cool folks up there and I, I had the fortune to work at ILM as well and being able to to be around that is there's so so much great knowledge in those in those people. Um so how how did you get your your break? Um going to the, the orphanage was the first the orphanage was the yeah. was the first and i you know even though i had you know um when i decided to get my master's degree i had already finished a bachelor's and already worked for a few years so it, um i was actually in my early 30s when um when i you know finished my degree um which obviously helped um because i you know um it helped helped me focus and and you know really approach my degree professionally um and yeah you know of course i wanted to do a compositing job straight away but guess what i took a roto paint internship just to get my foot in the door and you know did that and then obviously with uh with professional experience and you know good eye you can actually progress quite well i, I don't think i did roto paint for 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 too long and then I was actually I was actually lucky with a um, she became a good friend of mine, Carl McCulloch. We worked on um, uh, what's it called um, the Tarantino uh, film. Where we did some film damage compositing, mm. and um, we just used After Effects at the orphanage. So like we didn't even like Nuke was just on the on the on the on the brink of. Uh, you know, moving shake out of out of out of the industry, but um, we were still working in After Effects. So we spent lots of time like figuring out how we could use After Effects to to sort of do this film damaging um, compositing, and uh, that you know that was a lot of fun. That was a really great project, and in the end, I actually um, when I, after I left the orphanage, I went to um, Frame Store in London, and I actually managed to like get Kyle join us in London as well. So that's that was really cool. Cool. It's a small industry, and that's all. Yeah, it's very tightly knit. Yeah, everybody knows each other. That's why why one of my first mentors said, "Be nice." <laughs> Always be <laughs> nice. Like, yeah. What's your What's your best advice about how to progress in the industry? He said, "Be nice, be good, and be nice." <laughs> it's a small small industry for sure. Um, so was it wasn't uh, dust till dawn, was it? No. Not um, one of the later ones. Ah. Uh, it's a double. It's a uh... Bill Bill. No, no, no. It's no. Uh, two Robert Rodriguez and Tarantino. All your audience is gonna hate me for this now, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> maybe they can post the answer in the chat. Yeah, it will. It will. The Grindhouse. That's that's there. It is Nick. Thank you. 
Grindhouse. Well done, Nick. <laughs> cool. Um, so you brought up something really interesting there. I thought I was wanted to ask you about this. Um, you you hinted about how people used to get into the industry through doing roto and paint and on the compositing side, and it was match move most commonly on the 3D side. Yeah. Um, that was what people did 15 years ago or, or 15 to 20 years ago. Is is that and, and I since then we've had outsourcing, we've had all sorts of things um disrupt the industry. Now we're talking about AI, etc. But um is that still what's it like today for someone who's a, a junior wanting to get into the industry? What's a good route? It's it's for me, I think it's still the route because you do you do learn the you know, I think what makes a good visual effects supervisor is understanding every step of the way. Mm. And if you skip steps, like you like it doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, um, you know, one of my mentees was Andrew Nelson, who spent years at ILM as a as a professional paint artist. You know, that was his career because that's what he really enjoyed, and he also made it a career. And we have people in our paint department as well that you know make that a career, which is great. Um, but I I think it's it's always um, it's always nice to to learn every step of the way and you know it's actually one thing that we were discussing recently with working from home that it's actually quite tricky now with not having you know not so not like you know the, the more, more senior people are um more comfortable working from home but the, the, you know the people that the juniors don't have people that they can go like how how, how do we do this again like yeah you know and that's actually a tricky and that's a tricky bit because I said, well, let's see where we are in two and three years. But um, I think we're going to, like, if we continue like this, you know, where everyone's working from home, then we're going to have a problem with our mid-level um, artists in two or three years because um, they're going to grow slower. I'm, I've been really curious about that too. Yeah, it's. I'm wondering how, in general, with remote work, how we can bring some of that kind of randomness back in the happenstance that I get a lot of a lot of what really helped me in the beginning was definitely the things you described being able to talk to the guy in the corner who had been there for 15 years in the industry for 15 years and I had challenges and I could go interrupt him he didn't always necessarily want to be interrupted but <laughs> I could do it um I wonder if you have, have any uh any I don't know any thoughts on how we can improve that well definitely um, it's a big topic um, and it's and um, it's and everyone like you know not not just visual effects but I think mo a lot of companies will 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 face that because it's that you know when I go get a coffee and walk by someone and someone's doing something a way that they shouldn't be doing something because you know you just you can just see when you just walk by and it's like oh there's a much faster way of doing this like and you just share it like that's 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 how the industry works so you, you pass by someone's desk and either you you know you can easily ask someone or you know someone looks over your shoulder and it's like or you know sometimes it's also very cool like oh what are you doing like this looks super fast like how how are you doing this you know like so that exchange is, is a that has fallen sort of away because you know who's gonna share their screen it's like look how fast i'm doing something you know like it's, it's not gonna happen you know so that yeah. that that is that is something that we are working on i think the you know we what we've concluded this far is that we i, I think we we have to give up on the idea of wanting to go back to what it was right we just we just have to like okay this is like COVID has fundamentally changed everyone's attitude towards work and, and which is in a, you know in a, in a good way like in, in some form but also in challenging ways in others so um we will just have to figure out ways um how to go from here where to go from here like it's almost you want to um sort of find new ways of doing things how do we attract you know people to come to the office and you know how do we make it flexible and you know accommodate the flexibility that remote works offers but also ensure that we can nurture the team spirit and and make sure that uh people are progressing and we can we can nurture our, our juniors and train up because especially at frame store people come up through the ranks you know i i started as a junior compositor 
at Framestore in London. And, you know, we have Christian Munns who, you know, and Jonathan Faulkner, like who started as, as runners and, you know, like if, um, the people have been there for, for a long, 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 long time. And it's, it's actually one of the great things I think, um, that makes a good visual effects company that you are able to train your own people. Absolutely. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's some, some, something like some technology that doesn't exist yet that can bring this back, but online, uh, the ability to see things randomly, or if it has to be more structured than that, you have to build in kind of, I don't know, more forced moments of mentoring or I, I've been, I've spent a while thinking about it too. Yeah, and we shouldn't underestimate the the benefit that people because we have remote dailies. Like, a people can continue working while dailies are running, and b um, people are joining not just their compositing dailies or lighting dailies and modeling dailies. Like, you know, I have people sometimes from other departments join other department dailies, and they in that area they can learn a lot. Also, you know, if you're interested, you, obviously that's a great thing. But I think it's the um, it's the interpersonal exchange that is is really um it's a bouncing off ideas and you know techniques and discussing a topic i think that's really um what we need to bring back and i think uh from our point of view there is no like there's no rule there's no recipe that we've found just yet i think we're, we're exploring new things um at the same time we want to you know as supervisors, I think we want to also make sure that we are the ones who are attracting the people to be in, you know. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and how, how did you become a, a visual effects supervisor? What, what was your the progression through through the ranks? Um, in, a, in a short um, summary, so I started in Roto Paint then compositing, junior compositing, compositing, com, 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 lead, com soup. Um, and then from com, com soup to, um, I did my first show as a visual effects soup was um, All You Need a Skill, um, the day like uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, I think. It's the, uh, and that, you know, like you sort of, I slipped into that, like it was a shared show um, with Jonathan Faulkner. And he sort of said it was a shared show in the meaning in two locations in Montreal and in, 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 in Frames of London. And he sort of said like, okay, I think you can take care of this by yourself now. And so you get sort of dumped into the cold water a little bit, but you know, yeah. uh, it's, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of um, determination, I think. And, you know, always uh put on like your put your best foot forward always you know always try to you know understand what what's the you know for the for the benefit of the project and you know not really obviously care for your shots and your work but at the same time also try to understand um what else is out there for the project and you know what what does the show need and you know sometimes you know suggestions and you know something that uh someone didn't think of proposed that you know what's it, what's it like being a vfx supervisor what's what's the the job if you can if you could if you can explain it i'm sure it involves tons of things that's different every day but yeah and i think that, i think that's partially the the exciting bit of it is that it is different on different on every show like every show is different because um every client is different I mean, obviously, and then if you do a sequel or like a, a re repeat with the same team, but even that happens, you know, very few times that it's exactly the same team. But um, I think that's that's one of the exciting bits that you are depending on the project. You are responsible for um, a certain amount of, of shots or sequences. Um, it could be, you know, it could be a show like Paddington where, you know, uh, we have a, you know, a photorealistic bear that has to fit into some live action footage and you know that that's a very different um it's a very different uh task than alien covenant um where you know you have to create spaceships and space and you know make make really cool space shots and then you have aeronauts which almost 
almost documentary like you know like that's why i think the variety of work is is super interesting um and then yeah what you have to do is um i want to say you you you'll delegate um the right task to the right people yeah and you have to you have to as you said have the the eye but also um what what makes a good uh, visual effects supervisor? What what uh, what skills do you have to develop that different that are, are different than just being a, a, a another type of supervisor, CG supervisor, or or a comp soup, or a visual effects artist? I think the I want to say I mean obviously um, CG supervisors obviously have lots of technical understanding of why certain things work and why certain things are more efficient to do in a way that way and you know and, and rendering and you know just making sure that you use your farm and, and machines um, efficiently or you know applied methodologies in the pipeline efficiently. And compositing supervisors um, these days obviously have. A huge technical knowledge as well um but they obviously have uh you know the they they are also my eyes on the ground and just making sure that um everything is consistent i think the added skill for a visual effects supervisor is really also um understanding and working with production and the client and making sure that you deliver um and you know voicing your concerns when when required or um you know having good or or difficult conversations with your client when you know they're they are not able to express a creative you know a creative brief and then sometimes you have to help them with that and 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 really you know sometimes you have that you know present something and they're like oh this is not at all what i wanted and they're like well i'm sorry i really misunderstood you but you're really the translator between your team and the director's vision or you know and you know obviously it's, there's client supervisors as well and i've just been client supervisor on 1899 but um usually i'm, I'm vendor supervisor so there's um a little bit of a translator's um job and diplomas like diplomatic job um as well you need to be a good negotiator and um i think with what makes a good visual effects supervisor is how to get the best out of your team in the time that you have because there's never enough time that they will never like visual effects or arts like especially in commercial arts i think there will never be enough time to to do what you need to do and you just have to um agree on this is this is our finished level, you know, like this. You can probably go back through all the shots that you've just final last week and then determine that you, there's this to fix, that this to fix, that this to fix, you know. But that's the same thing with, you know, drama shots or like principal photography. You know, you could, if you haven't got it by take 28, then probably that you know, one of them will, will suffice, you know. And yeah. the lighting could maybe, the DOP thinks the lighting could be better or, you know, or the gaffers or, you know, the or production design will think, oh, if I had, you know, one more day, I could have built this or, you know, like it's, it's, it's in every artistic um, job in our industry where this is the case. Yeah, yeah, you just, but you have to get it done. At some point, you just run out of time rather than, <laughs> rather than yeah i think we all see everything we ever did still having things we'd like to change or probably we're glad that it's done and we can move on to the next one um yeah how so how is um talk bringing in the this virtual production concept that everyone's talking about these days um i know that you've worked on a number of movies that have been kind of pivotal in in pushing that forwards um what in talking about roles though particularly before we get into it more what um there's a new a new role that's emerged which is the the virtual production supervisor um what what is that that's different than a visual effects supervisor in your opinion um well as a, as a visual effects supervisor on a virtual production show you still responsible determining determ the de determining what is best for the show and how to use this tool most effectively and i think that's um 
I think that's a cu crucial differentiation. Um, and a virtual production supervisor really focuses on the virtual production. They make sure that um, whatever we decide as a as a creative leader team um, should be virtual production uh, is then you know translated that way. But especially in virtual production, um, there's a lot of decisions to be made based on uh, stage availability, schedule, and um, you know the script and scenes that lend themselves and some, you know, a simple, um, a simple t change in from in time of day in the script can change the, you know, feasibility for virtual production. If you, you know, if you write Sahara dawn, oh, that's good for virtual production. Sahara midday, that's not so good for virtual production, you know, like, so you like that, those are the things that you have to pay attention to, you just don't go into everything naively. And it, you know, it's almost, um, uh, it's almost that you are evaluating constantly how, how you can translate this into, into good visuals, I think. And how, how have, um, how have you seen it affect the visual effects industry? Because you've been um, through through Avatar, which has you know had a huge part to play in in this, and yeah, and the project. and the on the first Avatar, we we did actually like um, a rather small part, but we did we did some, um, and in two thousand nine, we did we did some work with uh, with, with Jim, and I actually was lucky enough to go on set and 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 shoot, and that was that was obviously already using some virtual cameras and you know when jim like hey christian have a play with this you know and this is like it's really cool like this is, those are the things that um you always think are possible and now they are possible and the same thing with with gravity gravity was really using the same technique but just as a lighting tool like you know all these you know space tumbling and spinning shots were were made possible by you know rotating lighting scenarios around around Sandra Bullock and you know um so 1899 was really my my first one where uh we we were tasked with um putting final pixels in camera like in camera visual effects and that was a really exciting moment to combine all like everything that we've learned over the years um and it's uh yeah i'm very pleased where that landed like i, I visually i'm i'm very very happy where where that landed it's um but you know for for me some people were calling it a, a revolution which i i disagree it's an evolution like mm. you know if you look at hitchcock's birds like they use you know some sort of rear projection and you know it's been around for for ages you know and um like I think the the benefit now is that we can use a game engine that is good enough to recreate parallax with with a short enough latency that allows us to create an illusion that we can actually generate um, in camera visual effects. And you know, I think the guys from from ILM and Mandalorian pioneered that in a in a really good way. And I think things are evolving very quickly and uh the technology is more evolving very quickly and it's becoming a great tool if you like i just did a a, a panel in germany in, in stuttgart about virtual production and one of the things that i said i want to be sort of like an ambassador for virtual production in a way because um there's you know there's this hype about this wonder tool but at the same time there are uh, there are so many projects that have um, not been very successful using it um, because um, things, you know, were not planned um, carefully enough or, you know, things got like the mindset changed. And I think we were very, very fortunate on 1899 that we had a director, a DOP that did tend um, the production designer and visual effects artists and virtual production artists that wanted to make this work. And um, we all collaborated. And to a certain degree, we we shot everything that we that we did for virtual production as if it has to be the final pixel because also it was an independent production and there wasn't 
there wasn't an unlimited bucket of money that we could go back to. And um, we knew if we if we didn't hit our mark of like we were aiming for for fifty percent, and I think we were, we were right on the money there, like maybe even a little a little bit more. Um, if we didn't hit that mark, then we would have a budget problem, and that's you know that becomes that becomes then again also the responsibility of um, the visual effects supervisor that when you are there on the day on 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 set that you look at the the shots with the with the director and determine can this go in the edit are you happy with this like and you, like for me it's then it's reading the director whether he says yeah yeah it's fine or he actually means it you know like that those mm -hmm. sort of things where um you can sometimes tell that he's not happy but you, we have to move on because of the production schedule and those are the things that you then have to raise like if we're not getting like if you're not happy we need to do it again like you know like we have to make sure because if if we are doing it virtual production and then again in in visual effects that's when it becomes a you know expensive that doesn't mean that you're angry yeah <laughs> yeah but also like but also like it doesn't mean that you like i think that's also very important to understand that even if you do virtual production, there's still going to be visual effects shots because mm -hmm. wide establishers um, on, a, on a wider lens, on a 37 mil lens, on an anamorphic, or you will probably see some some pixelation or some some more artifacts or some of the um, depth of field is so long that it, it's too sharp and it just won't hold up because the resolution isn't isn't. But that doesn't mean that you won't get the other 80 percent of the day covered with longer lenses and cellular depth of field that you know it doesn't mean that you have to try and achieve everything in in camera but it also means that you like you, you discuss these things and like how, what's my percentage what we want to get in camera um and there were definitely shots on 1899 that we we just shot and we just um we actually <laughs> we actually did uh, on on purpose we sometimes just shot into the into the wall with a wide lens just so um the director had a shot that it's like this is the shot that i want you know like even though we knew it was going to be a full cg shot but he did the composition on the day it's like well, can we move can we move it around like this and can we you know can we move the ship over there you know those are the things that are that what makes virtual production a a very powerful tool and um on top of in-camera visual effects there's all obviously also virtual scouting and all these things which which is all part of virtual production they, that make filmmaking just, you know, bring it to the 21st century, if you will. Like it, it's a it's a very, um, very powerful tool if you use it wisely. So, so um, yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> so you were with some of those shots, you were kind of using the volume to explore the the concept, essentially previsioning it on stage, knowing that it was going to get done in post as well. Um, no, so you have to like that's the thing like a virtual production you have to like you do all your planning in virtual like in VR yeah um, with um, which is again it's a it's a different type of asset it's a much like because in VR you just really need you don't need 20 frame, 24 frames a second you need like you want to have 90 frames a second 90 or more yeah yeah to have it comfortable because I, I naively <laughs> cranked up my settings and it's like well 20 frames a second and I got terribly sick <laughs> <Yeah. VR. laughs> it's just not it's just not a lot of fun um so yeah but um no you virtual production really requires you to plan ahead of the shoot day so if you can't approach it in a way where you're just there on the shoot day and and just say oh let's have a look at, you know where we point the camera and you know like you need to know what you're doing you want to you want to have you want your director with a VR headset before and you know, lay out the lenses and cameras, and so that the a we can prepare the assets and the backgrounds um, more accurately. Um, obviously, every director always wants to have 360, but they will, you know, as you do your VR scouting, um, it becomes clear oh, these are the the aspects that need really need to work really well, and then um, you need to do a pre light, and the pre light is something that um i found very difficult to as a, as a concept to get into the first ad's and the production crews head and even the dop because never no one really understood they all thought it was camera tests 
Mm. And I said, I sent in like at some point, I said, we have to stop calling these camera tests because this is the DOP and the director signing off on the lighting. Because if we start lighting with virtual production on the day from scratch, we will just be wasting a day. Like an, a day is expensive and a shooting day is very expensive. So we, we want skeleton crew for the pre-lighting, but with the director and the DOP there to say, it doesn't even have to have the main cast, but like stand, like appropriate stand-ins. But you want you want them to to look through the camera on the final monitor and say, yeah, this is this is what I want. This is this is what we're aiming for, and that gives us you know, gives production design on the pre light. It it won't be it won't be the whole set. It's just not feasible for for schedule wise. But you bring in exactly um, a skeleton production design. You you bring in, um, but the lighting has to be set. And um, your exposure, so that the the brain bar, what you call it, is like which is which are the guys and behind the behind the screens, really, um, that they can save their settings and every tweak everything, and make sure that everything still runs at twenty four frames a second, synced. Um, and then when you come on the day with everything final, final cast, then you just have to do tweaks rather than starting from scratch because it is actually quite a lengthy process. Right, yeah, and you've you uh, time is money uh, on the shoot day a lot more than it is in re the rehearsal, essentially. Yeah, which is it. It feels to me um, more analogous to theatre in a lot of ways than than cinema doing virtual production. <laughs> um, so what what do you what what do you think that the virtual production um, tools? I, I sometimes people call it. An industry but it's still the same industry we were working in before it's just doing it in a different mode or whatever um there's some challenges to getting it more um into more people's hands there's as you said some people have, have tried it and not had a good good time with it um what do you think that the the tools need to succeed more for more people well, I think the tools can always, you know, like even with Unreal Five and Five Point One, and um, they can like the tools can only 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 ever get faster. Like I think that and handle more geometry and you know you know provide better global illumination and and stuff like that. So things will just, uh, but that's almost a natural cause. Like I think, um, and not a natural cause. Like it's an, almost a an, an natural trajectory for for, right. for for Unreal. Unreal is always going to get better. Like it's. I don't, I don't, but I think it's, um, it's really the, the human being, the, the collaborators that, that need to understand the tool because it can actually be really, really expensive. As I said earlier, if you, if you don't do it right. And, um, if you have, if you have a project and you sit around the table and you have the feeling that your DOP doesn't want to do this then i would always advise against it you know like like because you can you can tell in the meetings if everyone's invested in it um or not but any given uh, link in the chain can can make it break you know but it doesn't also right. like it's, it's also like you know i think marvel does it quite successfully where they they're not actually aiming for for um in camera visual effects all the time um, sometimes they, you know, sometimes they, they use it for in-camera visual effects, but sometimes they also use it for a lighting tool and that's planned and that's fine because then you're, you don't spend a whole lot of money and time on, and on the virtual production assets. You just make sure that, um, it really becomes a, a lighting tool when you, you know, like you, like we did on gravity, like, you know, it's like the same thing, um, that can be very successful. So understanding how it can be used and where to use it and, uh i think the most important thing is really the implications on the on the schedule that people understand that your shooting day one becomes the tipping point and what used to be post-production part of that will just flip over and all of a sudden you need six eight months ahead um of the shooting day to to prep and prepare and test lots of camera tests but also pre-lighting days um and co collaboration i think you know even even with experience they, there will always be departments or people who are being caught off guard 
where um you know you speak to the production designer say well we, you know we decided we're going to build this let's say we want to build this dining room um we need to know what which wood what tables and and he's like this is shooting in july we have february i haven't even thought about which which chairs i can rent for for that shooting day because in their mind they're shooting in july or august and they're going to look on the market maybe in june what's available and then rent those chairs and but we need to build them ahead of time so that's actually you know i think as i said we were really lucky on 1899 that uh um, the collaboration was was really really good and um there was an understanding i was like okay if you need it okay well then let's decide on something let's try and try and find something and you know sometimes there were occasions where it worked and sometimes we had to make some tweaks later on you know what were, what were some of the the challenges in in figuring out on 1899 figuring out what could be or should be virtual production and what shouldn't be um obviously the you know we had uh one of the benefits was that it wasn't episodic like it was eight episodes like it wasn't a 90 minute show it was it was eight hours of content that needed to produce and we had a um a cruise ship where we wanted to like being able to go back to the same weather conditions over a six month shoot on or like repeated weather conditions like if you were to try and do that on location or live over six months you would you know would, you would have seasons like you would like the consistency that you can get out of that um is 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 quite brilliant actually um so that was that was a huge benefit um that we 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 had repeated scenes in a, a limited location um, that we needed to get get back to um, the same thing with you know obviously like the dining room where we went back to multiple times, and you could just bring it up and um, you can you can have a variation of that on the Prometheus, and then you can have uh, some one-off uh, locations as well, like like uh, Poland or Scotland, and you know, so it was really like there were actually more locations for the in the script that landed itself uh but then we looked at the schedule and it was like well we only have one stage so we can't fit everything just because it's there we can't fit everything so you know it, you just like if you want to do everything in, in one stage and your your production schedule runs longer because you don't you're not working as efficiently because you turn you have turnover times between between the days um that um becomes ex expensive again so there's you know it's a it's a tetris puzzle that's ongoing and it, it changes all the time but i think i think the most important aspects for us was obviously bo and yanchi have a um a color palette that is always a bit muted and and earthy dark colors you know we knew that from from the get-go a because of dark like we, we always knew what world they were going to be in but also speaking with Bo, like was quite clear that that's what he wanted and he always wanted a, a moody overcast sort of scenario and uh yeah we just you know yancha was writing the script and we we took it apart and decided well oh, this could this could fit and then we, we looked at the schedule and then you make a version one and then a few things change and then all of a sudden a location isn't available and then see if that location can actually go in the virtual production and we can find another full location for something else so it's um nothing is rigid in virtual production but i think nothing is rigid in film production period you know right yeah no it, it, um, were there things that um you thought we're going to make good virtual production shots that in when you got to doing it you realized that actually they didn't work as well as you thought mm. i no i don't know i think we we did some really good planning i think it was more um i was mind blown how well the dining room and how well scotland worked like for me that those were the things that were like I sort of like we did pre-lighting for the decks and I think because it's sort of a vast open space and you have a sky in the background you sort of get an idea very quickly that yeah I think this will work and but the dining room a was quite complicated to do because it was an indirectly lit um big large interior space so doing that in real time was 
very very tricky and we did lots of light baking um to to get there um but looking at through the camera i was like this works like it's so impressive like it was it was actually quite a weird sensation standing in in the in the circular like 270 degree stage and uh turning on the dining room all of a sudden the sort of like the the roundness of the wall disappears and it makes it a rectangular <laughs> open space uh room but uh, yeah i think it was more um being impressed how well some of the stuff worked uh, i think that was um that, that was that was really really impressive we have a, a couple of questions come in from our listeners um Somebody's asking, um, how was how was it water, how were water environments approached in the volume? Was it stitched plate photography, real time rendered, um, some combination? Um, so the the oceans, and uh, we always knew that wider shots uh, will need ocean replacements, and it has it has really the water engine in in Unreal Engine is actually quite good, and we made. We made a custom modifications or using the like the the water engine or the ocean engine in Unreal Engine, but we made our own sort of set of parameters, if you will. I think we were quite successful with a lot of um, uh, out of focus ocean, but we knew that um, it wasn't. I think the, the the challenge there was the amount of surface detail you need for a in focus shot um is is just too high for for what unreal can do at the time and we we knew that so any sort of establisher and you know we in, in a focus ocean was always going to be a visual effects sh shot um the challenge we 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 had on top of that we did think about um stitching plates um but then we um through you know, through a budget and, and production planning, we didn't have a um, a disguise system that would allow us to to play back super high res stitched plates very easily. So we did it all CG, and um, it worked really well for what we needed. And I think it uh, worked really well to get us the basic, like we had some roll and heave and, and all these things in, in in there to get some life into it as well. Um, and it was we were able to. You know, predetermine some some ocean settings from calm ocean and rougher ocean, um, but the rest of the oceans are C, uh, CG. There's obviously there are some helicopter plates that we, that we shot um, for some big establishing, um, like the big the big shots with the clouds and stuff like that. Those are uh, plates, but um, most of the uh, stormy water or, or rougher waters are CG. But some some in, in in engine final pixels from Unreal Engine water. There there are some in there, yeah. There, but it's yeah. mostly the out of focus ones. Like as I said, yeah. the, the, it's the weird sensation. Um, like when we first started, both said, "Oh, it feels like we're two meters above the water, and we should be, you know, should be much higher." But we were actually we were actually at eleven meters. Like the deck was eleven meters above the water surface. But it's just the amount of detail. surface surface detail that gave you that illusion that um it looked like you were closer to the water because there wasn't enough surface detail um so once you started moving then with the you know with the parallax it became clear that we're actually quite high or high enough but it just wasn't enough surface detail but um it worked for out of focus shots yeah that's cool yeah details huge in in terms of scale it was a yeah, giveaway and things in texture. Yeah, your, your eye just um it's it's very it's very difficult to trick the eye. Like in that in those things like in perspective and parallax and and surface detail and you know that's why you know making stuff like making stuff feel like it was gliding like one meter above the ocean surface uh it was really down to the surface detail. Another question somebody's asking, I'd um, love to hear a bit more about your experiences with regard to flexibility on initial bids for a show, how much change you typically see once work is turned over to the vendor. Um, 
again, it depends on on your show. Every show is unique. I don't think there's a rule of thumb or I don't think there's a recipe that um, can be followed. I think there are um, definitely shows that change a lot and sometimes for for good reasons and, and sometimes for creative reasons and sometimes for things that come out the wash and the edit where they put this together and you know maybe they 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 missed a beat or you know something but others you know um they they come together they come together more more easily because the subject matter maybe is 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 a little bit more easy i think like as a maybe an excellent extreme example if you have a traditional visual effects heavy show with lots of green screens it's and you know it's demanding quite a lot from the director and and the actors to to in, imagine everything that's going to be there and then through through the visual effects design maybe uh later on you you find yourself creating more than you initially anticipated and all of a sudden it changes the story slightly you know or, you know inspires the director because you mustn't forget that there's quite a big gap between wrapping the shoot and then director's cut and then doing the visual effects and sometimes there's a big enough gap for the director it's like oh this is actually oh this is a good idea like so so change their mind um but you know a show like i want to say tinker taylor soldier spy where it visual effects are really just the invisible visual effects it's you know it's pretty straightforward and you you agree agree exactly and you execute exactly what you what you wanted to achieve and it's i've, I've once heard that it's um, not really about visual effects, but it's actually about filmmaking that you usually have your low and your high budget movies successful. And it's your mid budget films that are always struggling because they have just dangerously enough money to, to make changes, but then never really enough money to make real changes, you know, like, so they, um, that that's where I think it, a low budget actually can be very, and refreshing to work on because you have so many restrictions and that everyone knows that you have to you know work within that and make it work and you know you can't change you can't rewrite the third third act and you know on a really high budget uh, film again ind independent of visual effects you have the option to do more reshoots and you, you have to bring bring back actors if you want to if you want to rewrite the third act you can you know right yeah there's some people who are who are doing indie virtual production even on led small led volumes with really small budgets start, starting to appear it's kind of getting getting interesting on that end of the spectrum and so definitely like and i think it doesn't it doesn't need to be always high high budget virtual production it is quite expensive but there are ways like if if you just have a you know a sequence of like i think i think cars and, and trains are the the prime example uh where it actually can be super efficient. Like if you have, um, like a like re, like episodic where you reoccurringly on the same locations or people are driving through a location that you can't just get to, and you know just try doing a virtual production, it will work really well. It's just all about planning. What what challenges in virtual production do you like to see solved? What what are some interesting problems still people are still working on? Um, I don't know. I would, you know, I would be interested to, um, to see because we were working on Unreal on a custom stream of Unreal 427. Yeah. Um, be interesting to see what, you know, do a show on Unreal 5.1 and see where, where that gives, gets us, you know, um, maybe we can get even more stuff in camera because, the resolution of the of the surface detail is now enough that we, you know, we can actually look at it uh, and not be fooled by it. Good question. Uh, somebody else is, is going back to an earlier subject as well. Um, talking about the working from home thing or the remote work thing. Um, somebody saying, have you have you found working from home to be as productive? more productive less productive than working in a studio um we talked about this before before the uh, this uh, before we started live um a little bit it's one of those things where um I, again i don't think there is a rule i want to say we ha definitely have artists who 
have excelled working remotely. I also definitely have artists who have completely lost their productivity working remotely because they need to, you know, interact with people and sit next to people and, you know, have, you know, have that. And so it's, it can be quite challenging for some people. Um, I I think, you know, and we, we are pursuing that at the moment is like as a hybrid model, I think it's quite a good, good way forward where you use the flexibility for all their benefits but also use the in office time and 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 in person communication and interaction because we we are working uh on on creative problem solving and that sometimes requires for you to be in, in, the, in the in the room with someone else you know like it i don't like we we discussed this lately and it's like maybe we just need to take some some hints from actually film production where you know, reading lines like actors interacting with each other is just you can't do that over the Zoom. Like you can do, you can attempt to do it, but it's not like the same chemistry of people interacting with each other. And it's the same thing when um, we we are in the office uh, and I bump into someone. You talk, you know, just just by talking to, about another project, you get all of a sudden you hear that you know we've developed this tool or technique that I was like, oh, this, we should be using this, you know, like um, that exchange. So I think both of them have their advantages and both of them have their challenges. Somewhere in the middle, there will be um, um, a, a way forward, I think. I don't think we'll go backward ever. Um, we can't just go back to what it was. And also, also, I don't think anyone wants to go back to where it was. Um, but saying it's more or less productive, I I think I'm impressed how productive we are, um, mm. and I I want to say we've been just as productive as before. But it, it's not been easy, and hopefully we can make this you know more productive going forward and find find a great happy medium somewhere. Absolutely, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you as well a little bit about uh, this hot topic um a few months ago hot topic was metaverse but today <laughs> hot topic is uh people calling it ai but essentially in the most cases machine learning um how how are you seeing this uh starting to affect the visual effects industry again i think it's um it's uh, one thing that is uh incredible is how fast it developed in the last 12 to 18 months I think that is that is quite quite telling, and I think that's something that I think uh, we as artists or human brains have a slightly hard time and en like encompass it, like in like understanding that the exponential development of of machine learning and technology is going to be something that will catch us slightly off guard, but at the same time we we know it's coming um, in there are lots of things to figure out and uh, there will be things that need um, regulations like copyrights and stuff like that, um, that which is a huge thing. But again, I think we should see, see it as a tool. Um, I, I don't I don't see AI taking over the world um, in or machine learning tools. I, I, I you know, but just calling the machine learning tools. There's, there's just there's going to make things much more efficient um, and um, it's going to challenge some of the entry level jobs that I earlier said are still important, which, you know, I can see a world where we ingest a plate and you get block roto or roto and camera tracks and lens distortion like in, in the same task, like without human interventions, which we, would be super cool for from a studio point of view. But that again, it, it's sort of. Uh, takes away that job of understanding, reformatting, you know, like it's, it's such, there's so many things that are really important for a good um, pipeline and uh, understanding cameras and those sort of things that are going to be challenging in a different way. So um, again, I think it's going to be a, a tool um, that will automate a lot of things. It will make a lot of things more efficient. Um, and uh yeah, I can't. I can't wait where this is going. To be honest, like I think it's um, it's really exciting. 
Um, and I don't want to say scary because I don't think it, it is scary because, you know, I said earlier, the, the industrial revolution didn't make us all jobless and just change jobs yeah. and, and the jobs will change. That's, that's for sure. I, I think the industry is going to, it's going to change for sure. Um, but I can't tell you exactly how, you know, because you, you don't know until you start applying it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I think it's a human condition to to fear change and this is another change and it seems like a, it probably every single change always feels like this is the biggest and most serious and worst thing to happen to us ever at the same time as it being a, a real uh, a positive thing as well in a lot of cases there's all i think there's probably always been fear around huge changes like this it's gonna be i think it's gonna be really interesting as well to see where it goes, how it helps, um, see how it changes jobs. What, I, I've I've been trying to imagine as well what happens to if say uh, paint goes away or rotor doesn't need to be done by person match move. I'd be happy with those things too because I, I I wanted to move past them myself <laughs> as quick as I could. Um, but I think in thinking about what what I liked about working in a in a dark room processing photos what that taught me about cameras that no one has to do anymore um and people now don't have to go through that they don't get to learn some of those things and some of that's not necessary but they should but... they should you know yeah I mean, i'm cu i'm curious if you if you if you have any thoughts about how you can kind of compensate for the things that we don't have to do anymore is it like reading about the history of how things were done or just making yourself go through the the exercises to to learn yeah and then I, I i agree i i um in my graphic design uh, degree i had to be in the dark room i i had, I had black and white photography um and expose our own film and expose our own pictures um which is just a such a foundation that mm. that i i don't know like i i want to encourage everyone who wants to do something with with cameras or you know, in, in, in the in the CG world, just to do a class, like you don't have to, you know, you don't have to find a, a university or college that um, or a studio that offers that particularly, but you can do, you can do these classes, like you, you can just find like master classes of, of like, like, I think the opportunities that students have these days, or, you know, inspire uh, aspiring artists have these days uh, are, um, mind blowing you know just have to you know put your own sort of recipe book together and just never underestimate that understanding um the engineering of it uh, will ultimately ultimately make you a better artist leader you know like it's 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 yeah i i, I would encourage anyone to to go into the dark room and develop their own film and really understand it and I felt... it, it can be done very easily. And in terms of machine learning, just uh, one thing, one last topic I think I want to bring in is that yeah. maybe maybe machine learning makes us helps us focus on being creative. You know, like maybe it just helps us become better artists because everything that can be automated gets automated, and we can just really focus on the on the storytelling, which is great. You know, what it should be about. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it gets all the admin out of the way and allows us to focus on the the yeah story which is a i think it's something that's in that's uh often talked about with with people talking about visual effects and movies sometimes having too many visual effects and that getting in the way of the story or stopping the uh the concentration on the story sometimes um but yeah being being able to free us up to to be more creative i think is a very very positive outlook on exactly machine yeah. learning yeah I, I totally agree well um anything else that uh you're excited about and that you can see emerging well yeah there's so many things <laughs> um I, I think it's going to be interesting how how COVID has influenced the, 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 the cinema landscape the movie landscape um with streaming we're sort of seeing some rebound of of movie going but then it also will start um you know where things are going with consoles and mixed reality and um i, I don't think we are too far away from 
um, AR glasses. I mean, everything is still a little bit heavy and not wearable, but that will again, you know, it might be this year, it might be next year, it might be might be three or four years from now, but we will get there. So those are all areas where you know our oh, like the the parts of visual effects all of a sudden going to be a bigger part of, um, and you know, to a certain degree, I think game cinematics and, and game engines and visual effects is all going to become a little bit more blurred, which I think is exciting. Um, and, you know, they, we don't know if there's going to be more interactive shows, if, if interactive shows are going to be a thing of the future and, you know, generations growing up with it um, will become a reality. You know, my, my son is only seven and a half, but he really enjoys Bear Grylls and, you know, interactive, like, oh, send them this way or send them that way. You know, like it's something that we, like, I, if, when I watch something, I want to be entertained. I just want to lean back and not interact. But right, yes. for them, yeah. you know, like that, oh, but they find it super exciting. It's more like a video game, you know. So I don't know. There, there's endless possibilities. Um, it's really a little bit hard to um, to judge. But I think that's part of, as I said at the very beginning, it's part of the excitement of being in the industry or being in visual effects. And every show is different and every year is different. There's always something new. Um, I mean, I find Seagrass super exciting because there's so many exciting papers every year that I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like we can do all these things, you know. Um, I, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be very exciting that, to see all these limitations slowly disappear and you know i i am curious to what um we can make of it you know i felt at one point like at the innovation had really slowed down because we'd figured out how to do water and fur and all these things really well that it feels like it really kicked up a notch with um with virtual production coming in and all of this real-time technology feels like it kicked that back into a new a new gear yeah, and I think real time and you know machine learning are really gonna you know help us um, iterate faster and and really, as I said, I think maybe become better artists and better creatives and better coll collaborators and you know realize directors' visions and um, more easily because I th I, th I still think we are facing limitations of just schedule and time where it just takes us a long time in visual effects to to get to a really 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 good result and wouldn't it be great if we got there much quicker and then we could spend a little oh, maybe the camera should be here and those sort of changes where we now have to say ah oh, sorry we can't go back there that we can't you know it's all it's all simulated it's all done it's all you know it's all to camera and you can't change the camera anymore and like and people accept that and you know but g giving giving more flexibility to that creativity is going to be exciting i think i agree yeah i definitely live in exciting times this feels like oh for sure one of the more innovative times i've known in visual effects even cool. yeah well it's been a been a total pleasure christian thank you so much for for joining us today i i, uh, I really appreciate your time uh thank you very much for having me and um uh, just gonna Give a quick shout out to Vlad who who said hi Christian. I used I used to I hired Vlad when he was in <laughs> in Germany. He was one of the earlier comments there. He said hi Christian. So it's great to have um, so many of you guys uh, listening to us and uh, breaking the industry. Um, and you know, I think you guys have uh, so many opportunities, um, which you know i don't want to say we didn't have but um there's there's so much knowledge out there and there's so many um classes and and things out there that um a, you, it, it is what you make of it really um and you know don't get frustrated so it's a, it's a it's a long journey and it's uh it's, a, it's not easy but it's it can be fun i think that's good advice yeah and any, any any particular advice you'd give to to somebody wanting to who's completely new to the industry wanting to break in today yeah it's um i i, I see that like i'm i'm also on some some sort of like uh, 
discussion forums and Facebook groups. And it's, it's the people that are asking, coming to the, so I want to become a visual effects supervisor, which classes do I have to take? And I was like, this, not, this is not how it works. Like, like, what's your creative problem? What do you want to solve? Like, you have to be like, you have to have a, you know, no class is going to make you a, you know, a visual effects supervisor. But I think the experience and cr solving creative problems uh, is going to be, you know, challenge yourself. Don't expect everything being brought to you. And uh, any, you know, like sort of small anecdote, the Academy of Art University is a great school and it offers a lot of um, opportunities for me. It offered a lot of opportunities for me because I was able to collaborate with people, but that wasn't in the program. It was me who said, hey, let, why don't we make a collaborative project, you know, be, a project between, um, between different departments. And that was really cool because everyone got out, got something out of it, but it, it has to be initiated by you. And I think there's, there are other schools and, you know, other, other, um, uh, classes that you can, can take and you can build your portfolio towards that and don't sign up for something and lean back. <laughs> we were just actually at the school in, in Germany, like the, one of the professors there from 25 years, he said, the 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 challenge is that the posture of the students has has changed from this to this like people like like it's one of those things like they want to be brought everything to you and you know just be like so some show some initiative and uh, be proactive and challenge yourself and like come to a come to a class or to a school with a like this is what I want to do every teacher is going to be thrilled to help you be active in the process is what i'm hearing exactly yeah that's learning is not a passive experience it's a very very active no because you want to learn because you want to achieve something but if you don't know what you want to achieve other than a position then it's probably not for you <laughs> sorry right <laughs> <laughs> well yeah being being a a teacher for as a profession these days and running a school i wholeheartedly agree you know it's a it's a very the more we can make our classes interactive and active so people participate in them that's what we aim for because we know that 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 learning is is a very interactive process and that yeah people do have to that i think some of the fundamentals and uh while the tech has changed the fundamentals have, have not really like being passionate and hungry and pushing yourself a little bit and interacting, asking great questions, being curious, being understanding, problem solving. They're all the same. They, yeah. have, they haven't changed forever. And as a teacher, wouldn't it be great if a student came to you was like, I want to do this. And you say, ah, I'm not sure you can do this. And that, it, it would challenge you a little bit. And the next day you come back like, actually, we could do this. We could do it this way, you know, and that's that would be cool. I think as you know, if everyone who's listening, you know, it was a, you know, coming to your school or, you know, like challenge ad, he'll be happy to help you. <laughs> challenge me. Challenge yes, me. Yeah. Absolutely. Please, please do. I, and that happened to me today. Somebody was saying to me today what they wanted to accomplish. And I thought that sounds very, it was very ambitious. And I thought that sounds really, really hard. Um, and I could say that it's absolutely no way that you're going to accomplish that. But instead I, I said, that's very difficult. These are the challenges. It's not impossible. I'm not saying that to anyone that something's impossible anymore because I get proved wrong all the time. Um, but you know, re recommending to people that that um, they can be realistic enough, but then a little bit unrealistic because those are the, the interesting ones. Those that like, try and do something that hasn't been done before, or try and push themselves to do something they haven't done before. That's that's where the the magic happens. I think. Absolutely. And we can, you know, we can guide these people by like, hey, what you've done is like a full 90 minute feature, but why don't you do a five minute short, you know, instead and just focus right. on, on on that? Like, I think that those are the things that um, we can, we can help and we can guide. And that's, you know, that's what I think as, as mentors we are there for, whether it's in the industry or in, in your case as a, as a teacher in, this, in a school. Um, but yeah, those are um, fantastic opportunities that you should seize because you have access to, you know, people with experience. And sometimes something seems 
unachievable, but maybe there is an achievable aspect to it. And that's what you should be focusing on. And it's almost like you were listening to my conversation earlier. It was around somebody trying to make a two hour movie. And I thought, well, I just start and they never made a movie before. Like start with a start with a two minute movie and then see what happens. Exactly. <laughs> see if you can actually tell a story, which is hard enough. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anywhere, anything you'd like to share with anyone, like places where people can follow you, find out more about what you do or what you do? I'm, I'm, I want to admit I'm not a big social media guy. Um, I'm on LinkedIn if you um happy to connect. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not like I don't have, I have Twitter and I have Instagram, but I, I, I barely use them. Like I'm, I have enough things to do. You have actual work to do, I know. Yeah, I have actual work to do. Um, <laughs> um yeah but uh no like if you want i think usually if uh, um if you want to reach out feel free to reach out i mean most people that have re reached out with uh um feasible questions i'm always happy to help um again if you want a class recommended how to become a visual effects supervisor i don't think i can help um, <laughs> right. but um it, you know you know, people people ask the right questions. Or if you, you know, go to events, go socialize, go meet people. Um, as I said, it comes very early in the beginning. The, the film industry is a, or the visual effects industry is a small industry. You bump into the same people all over and over again, and most of the time, people are willing to 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 help and take take people's advice. Like if if you sh if you show your show reel to someone who's very experienced and he says hey, you should do this. Don't don't think that you're better than them, <laughs> you know, because they actually do usually have. And it's like, well, no, but I disagree. Like, I, I'm not going to do what he said. And you know, well, then, uh, then you know, then you, it's up to you. But I think uh, events, like, I know not everyone can go to SIGGRAPH around the world all the time, but um, especially in, in if you're in the LA area, you, you should, go when it's there or i think this year it's in vancouver i think um, it's in la actually is it yeah um yeah so if you can go go but there's there's other there's always events somewhere and um and also don't like i always find it very inspiring inspiring to go to theater and, you know it's a very different medium but i always see the costume design and the lights and the colors when I go to a theater it's like oh, just, I just we just nowhere near any of that color that we can get out of a theater and it's very inspiring you know so yeah great advice and uh, you said something really important there which is when when you're asking you know, someone like yourself a busy visual effects supervisor you're you're saying that you you want to help people I love to help people too um, but there was an important distinction then, like ask the right questions and ask ones that are that are um, answerable and clear. And because you you like doing that, I can tell. I, I like doing it too. If someone gives me a little discrete problem that I can solve that helps them, it makes me feel great. I'll do it all day long. But the ones that are unspecific or too broad or rambling or the whole page I have to read, you know, we're not going to get to that. So I feel was, I thought that was a really, really good distinction about how to how to ask somebody at the high end of what they do for help because they are yeah. willing. Yeah, yeah. I think especially on on um, on, on new social events uh, where you where you have like expositions or something where you have the opportunity to meet people, go and speak to people. Don't be shy. Most of, most of the people. We'll have time to to chat. Um, obviously, not all the time, but you know, the, be prepared with something. Like have you know, hey, I wanted to ask, you know, do I wanted to, you know, I want to do something like this. What, what's your advice? You know, have some have a concrete um, problem or a question or like at least a conversation starter. Good advice. Yeah, ask ask good questions, and you you can get a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> The quality of the question is important. Yeah. Well, yeah, again, thank you so much, uh, Christian. Appreciate you staying on for for some extra time here and sharing your your experience and your wisdom with our oh, listeners. Yeah, went, went over a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, this this is it's a never ending topic. Um and I've I've 
I've done this for, oh, I don't know, 15, years. yeah, 20 years now. Um, and um, it's it's the fun that it always evolves. It, it's always something new. Every, every year um, puts me in front of a new challenge. And, you know, two years ago, it was virtual production. How, to, how am I going to get all these shots in camera during COVID? Um, wearing a mask 14 hours a day, uh, you know, but we, you know, at the same time, it, it, it challenges you and that's, that's, that's fun. And if you are doing that ride with like-minded people who all want to make it work, it's actually a very, very, um, um, how do you say a very satisfying experience? Yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging but uh, as you say if you if you if you like the challenge and you like a good challenge and you like this particular challenge it could be best job in the world not without days where you like you have hard days for sure but you do that you have that in any job um yeah can be can be the best job in the world it can be well yeah appreciate you uh, sharing your time and your wisdom thank you christian thank you for having me ed you bet you bet um and thank you also to all of our listeners thanks for showing up today and asking great questions and being participating in this event and also a big thanks to our sponsor autodesk thank you for sponsoring this episode um we look forward to being with you again in a couple of weeks if anybody's interested in what we do as a school check out the website becomecgpro.com we have some cool new classes including a world building class with narwhal studios which is a formerly happily happy mushroom then that's a our big announcement for today um so anyway it's been a pleasure i look forward to seeing you all again soon take care thank you very much, much.